Okay, we're going to continue forward. We are going into Committee of the Whole. We have four items in front of us. Three of those we'll discuss here in the Council Chambers. And the third one, sorry, the fourth one, our biannual budget will be held in the Mayor's Boardroom. Our first presentation is a progress update on the City of Bellingham's Energy Reduction Initiatives. And we're going to have a presentation from Jeff Aslan, who's been working on our energy assessment here at the City from Sustainable Connections. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Pinky. Um, so, as Pinky said, I'm Jeff Aslan. I'm the Energy Program Manager at Sustainable Connections. And um, just want to uh, give the Council a quick update on some of our efforts in terms of um, our RCM contract and how we've been able to uh, look at city buildings and come up with ways for potentially reducing usage. And I'll leave time for questions at the end. Um, I apologize also for not having a chance to submit uh, presentation materials to council in advance. So just to kind of give you guys a little bit of a background here, um, there's a long history of support for climate action initiatives within the city. So starting with the climate action plan in 2007, um, where the city of Bellingham pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by 70% by the year 2020. And the Legacies and Strategic Commitments document sets a high-level policy for reducing the city's contribution to climate change in 2009. In 2011, there was a uh, big renovation project with Johnson Controls to uh, do a lot of HVAC projects within city buildings. Uh, that was a $6 million contract. Um, and then, so this year, 2016, uh, Mayor Kelly Linville declared it as energy year within Bellingham and showing support for uh, the city and participating in Georgetown University's energy prize. And also this year, a contract was awarded to Sustainable Connections to provide energy management services within city buildings. Um, Sustainable Connections has provided close to 600 energy assessments on commercial buildings and have developed quite a bit of technical expertise. Uh, so we're able to bring that along with a mission-oriented, um, nonprofit orientation to looking at city buildings. So, so far in our RCM contract, we're um, about halfway through as far as uh, the buildings that we've looked at. Um, we prioritized based on energy intensity of the buildings and looked at the largest energy users first. So I think that in reality, even though we've only done you know, numerically half of the buildings, our efforts are probably um, three quarters of the way through. And um, so for each of those buildings, we have a detailed customizable report that goes into all sorts of detail about um, all of our recommendations in terms of um, what type of measures might save energy and also have reduced maintenance costs as well as um, what type of utility rebates might be available to bring down those costs and what the energy savings would look like along with how the building is performing um, both compared to uh, other buildings within the city and uh, buildings nationwide. We've established a database for viewing utility usage for all the city buildings online all in one place. Um, so it has really detailed views as far as being able to see um, each building's real-time performance and uh, compare it to other buildings. And so far we've completed a, um, a few projects. Uh, we've been working with Johnson Controls to complete HVAC commissioning uh, projects in several buildings, um, kind of going over controls and operating schedules and, and making some tweaks to those. And also in the Light Catcher building, uh, Public Works Department is working on a um, lighting retrofit for all of the incandescent lights that are in that building. And this is just a quick screenshot of what our uh, utility management software LegalWise looks like and just kind of gives you a snapshot of how the portfolio of buildings is comparing. So here we're looking at, um, you know, roughly this represents, I think, 30-ish buildings and um, you can see which ones are uh, operating efficiently, which ones have high uh, utility costs and which ones are operating well and, and have low uh, utility costs. And so if we're looking at uh, 2014 as a base year as the energy prize competition does and trying to compare uh, energy usage within the buildings um, in 2015 and 2016 which were the competition years we see that overall um, electric usage has been up in both 2015 and 2016 
Uh, however, gas usage is down um, 18% in 2015 and, and 17% in 2016 as a whole. And it varies quite a bit from building to building as far as which ones are up and which ones are down. Um, but overall, I can say that, you know, there's definitely some buildings that um, could probably use some improvements and other ones that are um, operating pretty solidly. And so uh, when I was asked to give this presentation, um, I wanted to um, come up with a couple of quick recommendations that the city could pursue uh, this year as part of our efforts to win the Georgetown Energy Prize. And um, two recommendations that we had for um, quick fix, easily implemented projects. The first one here is reducing uh, computer energy usage amongst city employees. So if we look uh, across you know, all of city staff, there's over 1,000 computers in use. And um, IT the department has left it up to the individual users to control shutting off their PC. There's no overwhelming mandate to um, shut them down at the end of the night, although there's not really a problem with doing that either. And so our proposal is to have uh, council support for um, encouraging staff to be mindful about shutting down their computers. And that can be either left up to the individual user or uh, there's also an option for the IT department to adjust the settings so that it would automatically shut down at the end of the day. And if that were implemented across 1,000 computers, we estimated the annual savings at around $5,400 per year. And the uh, second recommendation was looking at lighting within this room, actually. And um, from uh, our assessment, we learned that the controls have been an issue in here. Uh, it's been difficult at times to control lighting. And also, um, it's required free frequent repairs. Um, unfortunately, the manufacturer is no longer manufacturing parts for it. Um, so it's becoming increasingly costly and more difficult to make repairs to the controls for this room. And so uh, the solution is, uh, that we propose is to change all of the lights in here to LEDs and have a much simplified control system that would allow for dimming um, and also have occupancy sensors. So during the day, if no one was using the room, the lights would automatically shut off after some time. And so this project we estimated at uh, $15,000. Um, there's a, a rebate available from PSE that would cover about 1200 worth of the um, upfront cost. And then from there, there's an annual savings on the electric bill of uh, $699 for this building. And then any maintenance and staff time that would be um, involved in making repairs to that would be on top of that as well. And so um, we intend to... Uh, come up with a, a, a list of um, projects and needs uh, as we work with folks at Public Works and uh, as we continue our assessment process in the future. Um, but right now there's two big um, needs that are, that are um, unmet at the moment. One is in terms of staffing. So having dedicated staff that can assist us in our process and um, you know, help the city save energy, someone who would be dedicated to um, overseeing HVAC systems, making sure that you know they're operating as efficiently as possible, and uh, maintenance in in a lot of these buildings, um, you know that's that's something that could really assist in the process. And also, uh, in terms of budget, we don't have a uh, defined um, operating or capital budget for projects that we've proposed, and so um, we would like to see some type of council support, whether that's you know, in, in the initial, maybe a pilot phase with looking at this room, or a more um, down the road, a more uh, complete list of um, you know, a handful of projects that we've selected and vetted and compared with you know, all of the potential projects that are in a portfolio of buildings and come up with a high level priority list that could be funded um, down the road. It would have all sorts of energy savings and, and maintenance savings and make building users more comfortable alongside that as well. So um, at that time, uh, at this time, I can turn it over to council for questions. Councilmember Lilliquist. 
Uh, first, Jeff, thanks so much. Um, as some people may recall, Pinky, I'm sure, will recall, um, several people on the council actually uh, wanted to move a budget amendment to create staff, uh, city staff, a resource conservation manager who was in-house, because um, you called it RCM, that's what it means, resource conservation manager, and they're common in entities our size and complexity. The school district has an, an appointed RCM officer. Um, instead, the administration found a way to contract for your services as our RCM sort of out of house. When you recommend staff resources, are you talking about um, the in-house RCM type functions? Uh, yes. So as part of our contract, we were to provide training um, and oversight so that within a couple of years, all of our, um, you know, all of our services would then be carried out by someone in-house. And so what we're doing is kind of establishing a roadmap of uh, recommendations that could be picked up at any time by anyone who's looking at one of our reports and they would pretty much have a to-do list to go through all these buildings and make those improvements. But having someone who was a city employee who um, you know, had familiarity and access to all the different buildings and um, could immediately make the changes themselves is something that we're not quite able to do. Um, so that's where having someone who has, you know, who's dedicated to this position and had the time and resources to do it would be helpful. Okay, well, I like that idea in part because the usual thinking is an RCM position, even though it costs money, saves money. You've shown incremental savings. I think the, the hope with any RCM is that they, in a certain sense, pay for themselves by creating efficiencies in the system. So I, I like exactly. your recommendation very much. Thanks. Council, any additional questions? Council Member Parker. For the change that you suggested for this building, and particularly this room, was it mostly just this room? or? Yes, it was just this room. There was another lighting project that we identified in um, the front of this building, mm -hmm. but the one that we were proposing as a pilot would be just for this room. So as you look through for $15,000, you felt like that would be the biggest change? We thought that it for uh, cost effectiveness, it wasn't necessarily on top of the list, but in terms of being high profile space mm. and in terms of the frustrations with controls in this room, um, that's why it was targeted. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions. One, I don't know um, how we'd go around the pro or go get to the process of asking employees to shut their computers down, but it seems like an easy ask. I don't know. I'm going to ask the mayor. I, I'm not really sure how to go about that, but that seems like something we should be able to do. <laughs> well, absolutely. I, 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 will, I will check with pub, uh, Public Works and, well, actually with Marty and, and see if it's just a a directive from the mayor's office or whatever um, to do some of the things that normally we'd all do like shut our lights off and shut our computer off and that kind of thing so uh, I don't think it would be a problem but I might find out it is well, well <laughs> we can we can ask I think that's a pretty easy ask for us to you know have some energy savings I think that's a good behavioral practice um, and then secondly, uh, the lighting and the controls in this room have definitely been a frustration. The fact that we can't even turn them off and uh, that the lights run all the time is, um, is not the kind of example that I think we want to be setting. Um, I think that if we could get one project done, if that's, we're trying to get one project done by the end of the year, right? Is that to close the... Um, and our electricity is up 2% this year, so um, maybe we could figure out how we could accomplish that by the end of the year, if that's possible. I'm not sure um, what we would need. We'll obviously support from Public Works. I know, uh, I do recognize your challenge of you saying you're being outside and having someone internal and in that portion. We've struggled with that for quite a few years in, in regards to having someone who is internal, who's actually monitoring energy efficiency. Um, so I don't know what it would take. I don't want to promise anything out of public works, but I'm, I'm hoping that we could accomplish getting the, um, at least one room, uh, this very visible room done by the end of the year. So I'm not sure what kind of, Mayor Kelly, can you give us some direction on how we would do that? Well, one of the things I want to ask, because the, you're saying that the assessment and the program is, there's a program 
that says what someone would follow. Um, certainly, I think Sustainable Connections has been invaluable in putting together that assessment and that program, and I want to thank you for the good work you did. If there is a program av available, I think what we want is we want that, those recommendations to be implemented. I think that's our goal. And so I think we should talk with Public Works about options about how that could get implemented because as you all know and as you've seen with the budget rec recommendations that I've made, adding staff right now may not be something that we can do except in very public safety high impact areas. So um, if we have a clear plan and we have an opportunity for that education piece, and I don't know if you've already done that with staff or We've worked with staff uh, in each building and then beyond that we'll sit down with staff to view operating schedules and um, to you know, go over the reports and our recommendations. So if we had project management on something like that, we may be able to do it internally. Um, I, I agree with you that it would be difficult to have you coming in and then doing the day-to-day -day work. It's much better to use consultants the way we've used you to come up with a plan because of the expertise in that area that Sustainable Connections has. But uh, I think that's something that we should bring forward. Now, anything that would be a cost would be something that we probably want to talk about the council determining if they would like to invest that those resources. So that would be up to you, especially before the, the end of the year because this budget's already been adopted. But if council has the opportunity to change the budget anytime they want, I know probably there's someone initials BH behind me or somewhere that's probably wondering why I'm saying that. Um, but having said that, that's always the council's prerogative. So um, if that would be a discussion for you to have amongst yourselves. Councilmember Lilliquist. So let me start the discussion. I think if I heard you correctly, Pinky, um, there is both symbolic and real significance to implementing at least one more energy savings program this year. We're in the running for a five million dollar prize. Uh, the Georgetown Committee um, will realize that that last capital project didn't show up on our numbers very much, but they record they record that fact. They're looking for effort and seriousness of effort, not just raw numbers. Mm -hmm. So if there's a way we can squeeze out one more capital project, I think it will, be, like I said, be both symbolically and practically valuable. Um, Jeff, if you could do me a favor and go back to you had these graphs. This is, this is why people like me want these things ahead of They're stopped. Okay, so federal building, energy consumption goes way up. I get that. It was largely unoccupied. Now it's largely occupied. Bloedel Donovan Park Community Center, the usage is like five, six times higher this year than last year. Do we know of any operating changes that explain that? Um, I think that building had um, a pretty low usage, would be my guess, prior to 2014 and 2015. Um, I don't think we've done an assessment on that site yet, but likely what you're seeing there is a reflection of a building that's pretty low usage overall, and if it usage goes up, from one year to the next because it's not being used and it's being used, then um, it's, it realizes to a, a pretty large percentage change. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Murphy. It might not be possible, but I could donate my council travel and training budget so then you don't have to, have to raise 14000 <laughs> Okay, uh, Councilmember Barker and then Mayor Kelly. But we had discussed possibly um, developing some type of a capital facilities list. Maybe we could start that next year, uh, looking at almost how we do the tip in a way. You know, there's projects and then we have an idea like where does the library lay in that? Where do all of these things lay in that? Could this be incorporated into what we're going to look like? After the beginning of the year, I'd like to see us have a capital budget next year so we actually separate out the capital and the operating budget. I think it would be easier for both the council and the public to really understand what capital investments we're making if they're not kind of lined up with the operating budget and we're putting together an internal team that's going to start looking at that. We have a capital list. I mean, there is a capital list. It's, it's lines and lines and lines of things. The shaded areas in your budget are the things that are funded, and then we have the unshaded things that are out till 17. Yes, there it is. 
Uh, so I think it would be easier for me, at least, I'm a visual person, to actually see what we're funding and what's still on the list and then every, every uh, two years or every year at the midterm, but every two years we decide if that list is what we want or if we want to move things around and we, it'd be kind of a separate discussion than the operating budget. Um, and it's how we did it at the state level, it worked great. And I'd like to see us do it in the city too. It's more difficult because the way we account for projects, we take money from a lot of different sources to actually pay for a project. So I would like to see us focus on the project we're doing and then talk about how we're funding it. Yeah, and so, I, th I think yeah. it would be more palatable too mm -hmm. for the public too. Well, have at that. some point in time, because we are so behind in our capital investments on both operation maintenance, mostly our facilities, and we do have a study that was done on our facilities. Um, you know, we might be looking at a different revenue source that will take care of some of those because the way we are putting money aside now, um, I think we put, I hate to say, Ted will say, yeah. So we, we put like $600,000 aside every year to, to work on things, but I think our, our list is six, five million a year. So, you know, obviously when we start talking about adding things to the list, we need to really look and see is something going to fall down next year or, I mean, we are at that point and one of the things that's going to fall down is Whatcom building. So, so I think that discussion with the council would be both educational and allow you to look at, you know, where the priorities are going to be for the council and where they want to make those investments. So we're, it's not like we're even close. And I think that's sometimes it gets kind of missed in the, the overall. Um, I was on the governor, Governor Gregoire's first climate change group that she had that was people from all over the state. And energy efficiency is something that I'm very committed to. Um, I appreciate the fact, even though it's been controversial, that the city um, has gone and replaced, you know, all our street lighting. I pulled into a parking lot of a store the other day, and I could see, and it was really nice. But I understand there's some downsides to that, too. But um, so it's something I'm very open to doing. I, I just know as a city, we have to prioritize everything, and the council has the ultimate say in what those priorities are. Councilman Borman. Kind of heard three different council people talking and dancing around this idea of fixing what we perceive as a problem with the lights. All it takes is for us right now to say we want it done and ask staff to bring a budget uh, uh, amendment forward for that money and we can do it. So if I heard that right, I'll make that motion right now and we can just get on with it okay. and do it. No. Okay, <laughs> so we have um, um, a motion to ask, I'm just writing this out, how we want to put this, um, Terry, did a you A motion want to... to accept the recommendations to replace the, the lights to an LED system and ask staff to bring back a budget amendment covering that cost. Okay, and we have a second uh, discussion. And Ted, do you have anything you'd want to add? This year. This year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I wasn't dancing around the issue. I, I feel like this is something we're going to be having a budget conversation and I felt like that was most appropriate place for us to have that. I'd like to understand the unintended consequences. Where's that 15,000? Is it just coming from our deficit? Is, is the, com I mean, would, we have to understand be, that. It would be just coming from our deficit. So, that would be, so that's myself, the only money there is. I just have more information sure. that I'd like to gather. I mean, it, is this even going to make a nick in that percentage? I'm all for it. I think that we need to figure that out and we need to next year figure out how we want to prioritize these things. But we have bridges failing, we have crosswalks failing. I mean, not that I'm against energy, but I, I need a lot more information before I, and if that means this is just bringing something forward and then I can vote on it then, I'm okay supporting it. But I'm, I'm not going to just say pull $15,000 out before I, I research it further. Ted. 
Thank you, Ted Carlson, Public Works. Perhaps since I'll be presenting on the Public Works budget a little bit later this afternoon, we could have a broader discussion on facilities, on capital for the facilities group. Um, and we can go over what we are proposing to fund in the 17-18 preliminary budget and can certainly talk about the balance of this year. I think at this point, for us to get moving on this, we're probably into the first part of next year anyway. Uh, we just have a few meetings left, council meetings left, and we we're going to come back with a budget amendment for the 16 budget. It's going to be in January by the time we can spend it anyway. So uh, I will make sure to cover this in my presentation later today. Uh, can I ask a question, Jeff? Um, I'm just pushing. I'm is it impossible for us to do it by the end of this year? <laughs> um, oh, budget aside, like how how long do you think the work would take? Yes. So uh, probably the biggest time constraint would be the city's uh, bidding process, and <laughs> so we've received one estimate from a contractor, um, but it would have to go through the formal bidding process and. Um, Realistically, I'm not sure if that would be at least a month, um, okay. if not more, for the bidding process before you know work could begin. Okay. Yeah, that's that, well, that's why I said that. We would we would need to advertise it for at least two weeks, and our typical contract okay. takes four weeks to sign. So, okay, so it's not. So then we already know that it's actually not realistic by the end of the year. Realistically, it would be a challenge. Um, I think the contractor could uh, get it done on a, a pretty quick. Time frame that, that we've worked with in the past. Um, that said, uh, you know, depending on how fast the city was able to come to an agreement that that was the project that they wanted to um, have be a pilot project that was you know funded for this year, and um, how quickly the budgeting process could could work through, it it is a possibility that you know um, if a bid were awarded within one month, that the project could um, you know be. Be ready to um, have a crew out here working on it within probably two weeks after that, and I would imagine about one week um, to, you know, get it all dialed in. Okay, Councilmember Lilliquist. Uh, speaking in favor of the motion, as I understand it, um, it, the council would be requesting that a budget proposal be brought forward to us quickly, and we can consider at the time new factors in addition to whatever we hear this afternoon. So I'm still mm -hmm. in favor of the motion. Well, I'd, I'd like to try. Yeah. It might not happen, but hey, if we yeah. didn't try, then we it to won't try. happen. <laughs> so we, uh, any other discussion before I call for the vote? Okay, we have a motion in front of us, and this is for um, staff to bring towards a, a budget recommendation to see if we can get this project done by the end of the year. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I didn't see opposed. Did we all agree? Okay, we did. All right. Okay, so motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much for that information, Jeff. We appreciate having a nice snapshot, and I appreciate all the work you guys have been doing towards the Bellingham Energy Prize. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd like a copy of your slides, please. Yeah, oh, yes, would, and if you could give Marie a copy of your presentation so she can send it to us, that would be. Terrific. Yes, I will. Okay. The mayor, too, please. And the mayor. Marie, can you give that to the mayor? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Next item in front of us is an ordinance of the City of Bellingham, Washington, regarding Planning Commission membership. Um, consideration of an ordinance of the City of Bellingham regarding Planning Commission membership amending the BMC regarding the makeup of Planning Commission members so that no more than three members of the Commission may engage principally in the buying, selling, developing and construction or investment in real estate for profit as individuals. And um, I'm going to see Councilman mm -hmm. Borneman if you wish to say this is your proposal, yes. if you wish to say some comments. Yes. Uh, thank you, Pinky. Uh, the intent of this ordinance is to address the possible appearance of bias by one sector that could benefit financially by the recommendations and decisions made by the Commission. I want to state right out front, I have no problem with anyone on the Commission, nor do I feel that anyone on the Commission has acted for personal gain that's motivated this coming forward. A reason for bringing this forward is about appearance and potential problems that may arise. Anytime there is a potential for large amounts of money 
to be made or lost over decisions made with land use decisions, there is a potential for bias to arise with decisions when people who make their living from increased development hold a majority in a decision-making body. If we can remove the potential or even appearance of bias, then I feel that we owe it to our citizens to amend the current ordinance. I think we're kind of we've been seeing all around us a, a crisis of trust in government. We see it on the national level. We see it uh, coming up on state level. And we have been seeing it recently on the city level that people feel that we have betrayed trust in them. And I feel we owe it to the citizens to be as transparent and open and inclusive as we can be to help maintain and or restore the public trust in decisions and decisions made by different bodies. Now the Planning Commission is a advisory committee that's there to help this council to decide and to make decisions on planning issues. And I personally feel that best decisions are made by a broad spectrum of interest working together to make those kinds of, uh, that, uh, that kind of advice in, in considering decisions. I think, you know, I do, you know, we have five, six people on the, on the planning commission right now representing the building industry, real estate industry. We had seven people. In past times, we, that wasn't as big a concern because we didn't have that heavy of a representation from any one sector on the Planning Commission. Now, I, I've heard initially when I brought this up, I was told that I was bringing this up to appease a couple people. Nothing could be farther from the truth, as you probably, if you've had a chance to notice the letter that was sent up here, close to 300 people have signed a letter in the past week in support of this because that is a more generalized concern than I think some people might, might perceive. Um, and so, so I've been hearing this concern, so I decided to, you know, to bring this, this forward uh, to this body. I think one of the other things I had heard, well, that will reduce, it will make it harder for us to fill the, the commission. Well, in the past, we didn't. We were able to fill it with a broad spectrum of people on the, com on the planning commission. And many times, planning commission is a stepping stone for people that end up working in this position. And I especially think if people know that we are looking for a broad spectrum of people to represent on the committee, we will have those kinds of, we will have the pool to be able to, to do that. To say we won't have before we do it, I, you know, I'm not quite buying, buying that. Uh, so that, that's why I'm bringing this forward. And, and like I say, it's been uh, supported by people all the way across the city and in a lot of different, you know, from a lot of the different neighborhoods and things. And so that's, that's uh, uh, yeah, this is, and this is up for discussion now and I will move later, but. Council members. Any questions? Um, Lillequist and um, thank you, Chair, for bringing this forward. Uh, I think nobody is going to disagree with the idea that we need broad representation on the Planning Commission. And so, you know, the sentiment behind this I'm entirely in agreement with. I also don't think there's a great deal of urgency on this. I think we can think about it for a while. There's no current vacancies or appointments. Um, yes, there are. Oh, there is? Four coming well, up at the end of the year. 
Okay, so uh, I changed my thinking on that. We need, to, we, need to, we need to chew on this now then. I want to say a, a couple things. First of all, the Planning Commission is different from all of our other advisory commissions. It is the only one that is governed by rules under state law and authorized by state law. It is, I think, the only one that is mandatorily covered by the uh, requ legal requirements for fairness and appearance of fairness. It is much more like the City Council than any other advisory board. So, you know, this isn't any old you know, body. Um, so I, I think that is unique and why this board deserves our particular attention. In addition, as Terry mentioned, the Planning Commission is advisory to the City Council. Its primary role is to um, govern or to, to advise uh, on land use issues, which are the City Council's unique responsibility, not state government, not federal government. That's a local government function, and there are local government advisory body to us, and we are the local legislators who make land use decisions. Again, there's something unique about the Planning Commission, why it deserves our special attention. Um, I also can say that my experience as a member of other governing boards is we take particular attention, you probably are on boards too, particular attention every year or when we appoint to look at the board to see who is on that board, what are the backgrounds, the experiences, the strengths, hey, we need someone who's stronger in this area. We need a little more perspective from this uh, part of our community. And boards rebalance themselves very intentionally uh, for that purpose. I think we haven't done that uh, for the Planning Commission. And I think part of the reason is I think there's a weakness in the way the process works. The way the process works is the mayor gets a number of nominations and then she considers the best in her opinion and brings it forward to us. And then in isolation we consider the one person as opposed to having two or three candidates and considering at the time who's on the board, considering at the time candidate A over candidate B so we can make a decision based upon representativeness, not just whether or not the one and only candidate is a good person or seems to be uh, reasonably committed to the public good. So I think we could improve actually how we vet candidates in addition. I think that's an additional improvement in process that we could, as a council, um, you know, make a, a, a policy for pointing uh, to, you know, the, the board that's advisory to us. I think that's parallel or in addition, additive perhaps to Terry's proposal. So I'd like us to uh, consider that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether or not we need to pass this ordinance or amend this ordinance or improve this ordinance in the next uh, week or two, I, I guess I'm not sure about that. But the the heart behind it, that we need a representative planning commission, I don't know how anyone could dispute it, and I certainly support that. Councilmember Hamill. Thank you. So I think that this ordinance, as it's written, does a good job of defining what it doesn't want, but it doesn't include what it what the community does want. Um, so I looked around a little bit uh, over the last week at different planning commissions across the country to kind of get a sense of how, how they do things in different cities. Um, and some language that I felt was um, that could be added to this uh, ordinance or this proposal um, could be um, the membership as a whole re shall reflect a broad range of opinion, experience, and expertise with the objective of providing sound advice representative of the citizenry. To achieve that purpose, it should include uh, residents from different neighborhoods within the city and among others, members of diverse and underrepresented communities and citizens active in neighborhoods or community affairs. So that I think that um, if there were some language, not specifically that language, but maybe perhaps, that's, that was written in Seattle in 1980, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think something that, um, that, in, that goes towards the inclusion of a broader range of citizens within these, um, these boards and commissions, I realize we're talking about one right now, but it did trigger for me um, wanting to have a broader look at boards and commissions across the city, who we have serving. This, uh, these boards and commissions are often um, people's way of serving their community in, um, in the government. And sometimes, as Terry mentioned, the, that's a, a stepping stone to different uh, positions within, within government. So I think it's important for us to focus on um, providing the opportunity for underrepresented um, uh, communities to come forward and be encouraged to serve and to provide their voices and experience and expertise. 
Councilmember Barker and then Borneman. So thank you for bringing this forward and I totally agree. I, I think we have a, a larger issue that we've been noticing but it's there's always so many things that keep coming up to council on our agendas of like where do you put it and I had brought this up to the parks board. I had uh, forced myself to ride the bus everywhere that I went in the winter uh, when I got onto council and uh, one of the parks board meetings at seven o'clock in the morning at Bloedel Donovan Park mm -hmm. and there's no bus that can get me to Bloedel Donovan Park so my husband had to take me and drop me off at 6 30 in the morning while I waited in the rain for people to come for the meeting and I mentioned that mm -hmm. and certainly um, at that time the board was sympathetic but didn't want to change their their meeting times we've since moved to um, the mayor's boardroom which is uh, you know part of I mean technically not a go line but at least close to where buses travel so you know it's going to be tough if you if you want broad representation we have to really dig into our boards and commissions we have to figure out okay where are they meeting are we saying they need to meet on a go line what times are they meeting are they are they meeting at times where only people that eight to work eight to five or people that are retired can go um, how do we publicize how are we looking for I think for planning commission I think way more than what somebody's job is is where do people live and, and how do they live? I mean, we're fortunate here. I think you live in a condo. I think the rest of us all live in single family homes and mostly all in single family home zoning. So, I mean, it, we have to admit that we don't have that broad representation. And I would, I would like us to unpack and dig a little bit further, again, with most of our boards and commissions, maybe set some basic rules around times that they meet, where they meet, um, what the like what Dan was suggesting what the goal of the group is and I'd also like to see since I mean you said it very clearly that there's no current concern but that there's a, a concern that later like we don't have anybody right now I think is what I heard you say you, you don't have a problem with any one commissioner so I'd love to bring this to the Planning Commission I think they'd be a great group because if we don't have a current problem, I, w I went to go speak with planning commission members and some of them were like, mm, that's very interesting and here's the reasons why and here's some reasons why not. And I'd like to be informed by that from either past planning commission members or current planning commission members. So what I'm saying is we, we can focus very clearly that, okay, we don't want development community being the ones to tell council and advise them, but we could really miss out on what that same person offers to the community. Are they a parent of young children? Do they rent? Do they live on the north end? You know, are they, there's just so many things that I think we should look at. I think it's dangerous just to look at one and then start having these boxes that we need to check. So for that, I, I would like to take this conversation further. I think we need to allot some time on the agenda and I would like to get some information from the Planning Commission with it. I don't want to abandon it, but I, I think we do need to, we need to re reframe what we're doing, but I think we need to be extremely well informed before we make any decisions. Councilman Borneman. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with, with what you had to say, Dan. I like that language and I like, so I would have no problem with those, that kind of inclusion. In fact, you know, if we wanted to move to ask staff to, you know, work that kind of language in, that would be perfectly great. Uh, I said, and, and I said, I don't have a problem with anyone, but there is a current problem, and that is the, the current problem is the perception and trust problem that this council is having with this body with the public, with neighborhoods right now. They, yes, a whole lot. When 300 people sign within a week's time and you look at the names and the broad spectrum of it, that says to me, I've sat up here a long time, uh, that's, that says we are developing some real trust problems out there and maybe Maybe some people don't feel that. I, I definitely feel it when I'm, wherever I'm at out in the, in the community, because I've got people coming up to me, stopping me when I'm at the gym in the grocery store and others, what the hell is going on? So I think there is a problem. And that's why I brought it forward. Trying to find a way for us to restore some of, some more trust back with our community that we are losing. And so I do think there is a problem right now. I agree with you. I would love to work on a broader issue regarding other boards, but that's not what I brought forward right now because this is the one
that the community is saying is important now. And this is one that we can do something about now. The other, we can say yes, we will put off till next year and we will have a broad discussion about, in general, our other uh, boards and commissions. But right now, we've got an opportunity to make a change in perception and other things now. I totally agree, we need and I respect the opinion and we need of the building industry, real estate industry, others on the, on the commission. Their expertise, their ideas is vital to the planning commission. We don't need a majority. That is the difference when any majority of an industry can influence a decision. Then that's where the problem is. And yes, we can always say, well, you know, we got to look at just the individuals and blah, 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 and their profession doesn't, well, I've heard from people on the, on the commission that aren't necessarily part of the club that it's hard being, you know, that. Being, coming up against what is perceived as a, the industry uh, uh, body. So that's, that's why I'm bringing it up now. That's why I, you know, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Councilman Parker and then Lola Quest. Well, I, I think you're, the, the accusations that you're bringing forward that people from the planning, planning commission don't feel comfortable stating their own opinions because they feel overwrought by, uh, I, so I, I think you're talking about something that's it's more immediate and that we need to be taking action on that sooner. Like, that's what I'm hearing. I, I'm concerned that I'm hearing that because that's, that's something where there's a severe issue right in this moment versus a perception of people that it's not fair. So I just would like you to let me know which one of those things is happening. Uh, Mayor Kelly, then Michael, sorry. Just, I just in Mayor. response to that, if um, Terry or any of you up there have any um, planning commission members that are coming and explain to you that they feel intimidated or they don't feel like, because we're having this all through the city, it's not just on the planning commission where people are coming to me and saying, I feel intimidated. I would really appreciate, since I first appoint these people, that you let me know about that because I certainly would not tolerate bullying. Bullying is not one of my things that I think is okay. So um, if there's those kind of accusations being made, um, I would really appreciate it if you would um, you share it with all the council members, but if you would let me know, because that is that's helpful for me to know things about that. Councilmember Lillipuist. Thank you. Um, sort of in response to one council member's question about talking to other uh, past planning commission members, there are at least four past planning commission members of Bellingham on record supporting this. A one past planning director of the city of Bellingham and a past county planning commissioner. So these are ideas that make sense to people who've served in the position. I think they're pretty mainstream ideas, frankly. Um, I think at a minimum we should require breadth and prohibit imbalance. And as much as Dan's suggestion moves towards requiring breadth and, and Terry's suggestion moves towards prohibiting imbalance, I'm in support of it. Maybe the language can be tweaked. I'm not so sure about prohibiting them for five years, maybe just three years. I mean, I think we can work with the language a little bit, but um, the, the general uh, sentiment I'm still in support of. Um, I would like to say that it's important to have these rules in place because not all pressures and biases are overt. Sometimes self-censorship, sometimes just mm -hmm. a, a narrowness of vision leads to unintentional bias. Uh, you know, it, it, as Terry says, it, mm -hmm. no one had, that he knows of has acted for personal gain. It doesn't mean that our planning commission isn't unintentionally biased anyway. And I, I think in as much as we can avoid that with a good set of rules, that's a good thing. Uh, I, um, I would not be comfortable passing this as it stands. I think the wording is a little bit exclusionary. Um, and I kind of think we should take um, some time to discuss this and work on it a little bit. And I'm wondering if we could move this to a working committee and 
discuss it because I don't think that this is ready for prime time yet. Uh, Councilmember Borneman and then Lilquist and Hamel. Yeah. A couple and, and Mayor Kelly, sorry. Okay. A couple things. I can agree that maybe this particular language, but if you've got suggestions on language, you know, that would be a good thing to, br to bring up, you know, about what kind of changes. Dan did. That's why I sent it out well in advance so people could look at it and, and make suggestions and, and things and, and say what it is if they want something changed or if they just don't want it, just to say, I don't want this, that's fine. But I would, uh, you know, one of the things that has come up about is the council has the ability to just vote no. But do you know how hard it is on an individual, one individual's, when their names come up in public of us sitting here and picking out that person in this public setting to say, no, I'm not going to approve them and, and leave it. That's a hard thing for this body to do when it's based on, you know, okay, we've got to, you know, we want a greater balance and stuff. That's, that's a, a tough one to hold them up to public scrutiny in, in the, you know, on TV and say, no, we're not going to do that. That's why, what? It is, and that's, that's what why we, we do. That's why we don't. <laughs> it's our job. It is, but it, it's much better if we can set up. If we've got some of the to set those rules up ahead of time, so it we don't have to do the balancing and just uh, tell the mayor, no, we're not going to. We've got too many on on the uh, building industry now. We're not going to approve those, and oh, yeah. Councilmember Lilliquist, then Hamill, then Mayor Kelly. Sure. First a comment, and then I'll make a motion. My, my comment is I completely agree with Terry. Saying no to someone sounds like a vote of no confidence against them personally. Whereas if you had a choice between two candidates, voting for one over the other, everyone knows that one person can be chosen, the other one is not going to be chosen. It's not seen as a personal rebuke of the person who doesn't get appointed. And if we overlook those social dimensions of our decision making, I, I, I think we're making a mistake. We're not, you know, being truly aware. So I, I will, I will say again. I think we could have a better process of appointing. Mm -hmm. over, in addition to this, the mm -hmm. motion I would like to make is that uh, Councilmember Hamill submit his uh, proposed language, and he ask the staff to look at that and bring forward any possible changes for that uh, for us to consider at our next uh, next work session. Second. Councilmember Hamill. Um, I just had some questions as it relates to, and Terry, I don't know if you can answer these questions, but um, would a, a staff member or a board member from an agency like Colson CLT or uh, Bellingham Housing Authority or Catholic Housing Services, all of those are nonprofit housing developers, would that, would they be included in this uh, language here that you have? I don't know for sure, but may, prob, you know, uh, no. Probably it would include it as a major as part of the majority. Yeah. Right. You know, if I don't have anything against anyone on any of it, but it, but just as a majority. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess that. Um, so so adding in sp specific language about right. that. There's some other uh, issues that I have with. Um, the way that it's, uh, there's a line in here, the limitation of this paragraph includes, but is not limited to. And I know that language is, is often used in these types of documents, but I think that it Confirm provides. A, legal. A, yeah, it just to me it's a little ambiguous. I don't know if, if it could be tightened up, but there's a minor um, grammar editing that would need to take place for me as well uh, for this. So, Councilmember Murphy, and then Mayor Kelly. Well, I, Terry, I thank you for bringing this forward. I definitely agree with the philosophy. One of the concerns that I have is that, you know, I just feel like it's a very rare opportunity or a very unique circumstance when we even vote in agreement with the Planning Commission. I mean, most of the times we, we don't vote in their favor for what they want out of it. And so I just worry about a lot of the time I worry about how that affects the planning commissioners and who wants to volunteer their time away from their family and away from their, you know, all the regular stress of their life. And if we already have a problem with that, would 
limiting who can be on it dissuade a lot of people from trying to go for these positions because my goal is trying to get the most people possible to look at these positions. Mayor Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A actually, Roxanne, this body, for the majority of time, follows the recommendations of the of the planning uh, commission. We did vote a strongly against, well, we did vote against them when they voted to bring in the uh, South U Street and, and uh, the uh, Kayatek area with them. Yes, we did, because most of us didn't approve, didn't agree, staff didn't agree that that was necessary. And yes, we voted against, against that recommendation, but most times we do follow their recommendations. But that's one, you know, that uh, didn't fit with what uh, our staff was and with what the majority of the council was, was feeling in terms of what was needed to fit the population projections. Clean order. And yeah, in, in those cases, when it goes against those basic uh, beliefs, we will vote against. Point of order. Knutson. What's that? Point of order. Do we have a motion? We have a motion. Well, discussion. Council Member Knutson. I'll be brief. One of the things that I've, you know, the last 23 years, I don't think we've ever done anything, to my knowledge, anything close to this about the Planning Commission. I don't think we've looked at it. The mayor, whoever the mayor is, always brought something forward. I don't think there's been any, the makeup of the Planning Commission is what it is because people put their names in and the mayors pick and they bring them to us. This is very, um, focused on what it should be in the future. It got that way not out of um, anybody mm -hmm. stacking the deck. Mm -hmm. That was never the way. I know all of them that are on there. I know a lot of them that have been on there for years and some that have gone off. So I think we need to focus on this and the way it's written in, in Dan's language. But Michael, you made a point that I'd hope we don't go down and that is if we start getting involved in interviewing planning commissioners ourselves. I don't think that's a good idea. I've sat on boards and it's not, it just, it's not good. I trust whoever's sitting in the mayor's office to go over all the qualifications that there is, but with this narrowed focus so we don't look like it's an appearance of fairness in the future, that it's three this way, three that way. You know, it is sad that we have to look at it this way and look at you know the makeup and start diving into what they do for a living and diving into other things maybe their political philosophy with everything else but i think for the sake of calming things down just focusing in on the way this is written in dan's um language will be fine and in the future we won't have that problem again and we won't have to look at it again that way it's just the way it happened people step forward and and want to be on these commissions and i wish we had more people i know there's probably a lot of vacancies on a lot of commissions but i do agree we need to look at the whole totality of all the commissions in some way but not changing the way that they're chosen because i think that could turn into a football that everybody will just be passing off to everybody else and it won't be a good idea so i think we just need to stay focused on this i like the way it's written it's pretty specific we don't need to blow it totally out of proportion we just need to stay focused on the way it's written dan's uh, language that uh, you've moved sounds good to me so well i do want to hear from the mayor and the planning director because they're intimately involved with the planning commission yeah. I think that's very healthy. Uh, first of all, let me say that I um, support Dan's language. I think, I think a, a broad statement about balance on the commission is a good thing. And in fact, it mirrors the recommendation that, we, that came out of an informal discussion with MNAC. They believe that, or they um, proposed, it was uh, Cameron Jennings actually who said it, that, that uh, some kind of a, a, a statement about balance on the planning commission would be good. And I, I, I haven't thought about uh, occupation balance. I've been looking at kind of different kinds of balances like women and, and other things, but I always try to appoint who I think is the best person because we have people involved in development that have lived here their whole lives. 
that they come to the position as a father, as a neighborhood member, as a community member, and being a developer is just what they do. So let me just say that I, uh, if you could look at Dan's language or some, some rendition of it, that would be great. Dan and I had the privilege of attending an implicit bias training with the police department the other day. Uh, before I took that training, I didn't have words for how I, I, I felt about singling out an occupation like this rather than saying it should be balanced. Uh, but now I do because I really believe that the last thing we want to do on the Planning Commission is go to any kind of slots, like this is the neighborhood slot, this is the developer slot, this is the north slot, this is the south slot. We really need to have good thinkers on the Planning Commission that look at the facts and make recommendations which you as a council member always have the chance to vote for or against, and that's your job. You can't, I don't think, hide behind it's hard because it's, it's, it's what your job is. The other thing is, um, obviously, if you don't agree with who I recommend, you have every reason to uh, vote against that. Now, if we had an overall uh, goal explicit about balance, I, I would be fine with that. Then I could factor that into who I'm recommending. But to me, when we say we are um, biased against you because of what you do, and let's just say it's developers this time, but what is it next time? I am concerned about that because I'd like to think that every single person in our community who wants to contribute has an equal opportunity to do that regardless of their race, their religion, their sex, their sexual orientation, their job. Now, if you think that there is some implicit people making money off making decisions on the Planning Commission, um, then you have very little trust in me that I would appoint someone like that because I would not. I think you can look at the people that are on there and they're people that have different perceptions, but to use perception and perce perceived potential problem as a reason why we're prejudiced against certain occupations, to me, I just don't think it's right. And you have every right to say, Kelly, you are stacking the Planning Commission and I don't agree with you. I would be embarrassed of myself if I put people on the Planning Commission that didn't first think about the public. The public interest is their responsibility and the whole city. So slots and occupations, to me, should have nothing to do with how we run the quasi-judicial part of the city. The, the, the Planning Commission is not to be uh, political. It's supposed to be critical thinking, looking at the facts. You guys are the political people. You, you put the political you know, filter on that. But I'd like to think that the mayor is trusted to make the appointments that, that she believes is in, or he, is in the best interest of the city. Having said that, I do understand that it does not have any filter now. I mean, it's up to the individual person to say, these are the best people. And if there was an op a, a, a desire for the council to take over appointing planning commission members that are like interviewing or looking at choices and kind of doing that political thing up, up front, I, I would feel kind of uncomfortable with that. And just so you understand, the way we do it now is the mayor does not just appoint someone. It's the president of the planning commission or the chair, the planning director, the assistant planning director that does the planning work, um, my, and myself that do that. That's how we picked Lisa was the last planning director that we, or yeah, planning um, commissioner that we picked. And that's how we do it. So it's, it's an interview process of everybody who meets the minimum qualifications that wants to do the job. Now, in the implicit bias training, one of the suggestions that was made by someone was, if you want a more diverse looking um, police department or fire department or whatever it is that you want, where, where, where do you recruit or ask for people to come 
and, and participate. And so I was given some good suggestions about areas where we could look at um, different cultural and religious and um, income level levels to see if we could get a little bit more diversity. Um, difficult in our community, which is not as diverse as others, but there's a lot of diversity and those uh, people in those communities don't, don't respond. I mean, they don't volunteer. So I think that's important. And the other thing on Planning Commission, I mean, we don't have anyone who rents. We don't have anyone who, can't, who is not a, a, a homeowner. You know, those are things that are difficult for a lot of people in our community. And I think the balance comments that you made, Dan, mean we should be looking at all of those things. And I, and I certainly agree. So um, this is an entirely a decision that's made by you. I feel concerned that it's based on a perception and not a real problem. Um, if there is a real problem, then I appreciate Larry Horowitz sent me a list of people that I'm going to contact to see what their problem is with the process we use in the Planning Commission. So um, anyway, that's all I have to say. I'm, I really don't want to eliminate people or judge people based on their profession or their occupation, no matter what it is. So just as a reminder, we have a motion in front of us. We are in discussion. We're going to hear from Rick Seppler, then Councilman, Council Member Barker, and then Council Member Borneman. Um, if I might, just a couple of things. Uh, Council's prerogative clearly is to set the requirements for commissioners, just as it's your prerogative and role to select those commissioners ultimately and appoint them. Um, we as staff work with both uh, defined role and representation commissions and boards, such as design review and others, where we ask for certain representation and technical expertise because we need to bring that to the table. And we also work with at large. Um, I guess the sense would be is looking at those two boards, um, just to, to clarify what I've heard, is that um, if you designate an area of commissioner representation, the pro is um, largely you ensure greater diversity because you're sort of saying this is a limitation, and you ensure points of view are represented fairly. Um, the cons often we've seen are that those appointed feel that they need to advocate for the seats they hold and for that point of view, rather than often what is best for the community. Um, if you do at large, the pro is it provides flexibility to maintain balance, and uh, it allows for a, a broader range of candidates to fill the slots. Um, the cons are um, the council and the mayor must always weigh at time of appointment um, that delicate balance to ensure it's perceived as fair and how it works. Um, as I see it, the city's interest is fair representation and commissioners uh, who have the ability to work from a broader citywide perspective. That's what we always look for and that's what we always ask for on that. Um, the challenge we have, to be very candid, is very limited application. We have had a position open for almost a year, and we've had a handful of applications come in. So in a sense, the real problem is the recruitment, whatever the decision you make is, is getting folks to apply and having folks step forward to serve that role. Thanks. Council Member Barker. Well, I appreciate both of your perspectives, and um, I support uh, the language that you brought forward, Michael. I think that taking another look at this, oh, I thought it was your motion. It was your, but it was your motion. Sorry, okay. I support both of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I would like as it, I'd be happy to work on it with you all, but the I think there's terms that we need to make sure that we're defining if we're using words like balance. I mean that means different things to different people. So I, I would like us to be a little more specific. I think um, that very important if if you want to stay with. Uh, a very specific like what's on here now we need better definition as to what that whole committee you know is it is it a business owner that that actually benefits off of more population or you know there's there's so much that could be looked at to who might have a job that might potentially benefit from a planning it, so I'd like it to be a lot more specific on on the jobs so that we don't get into a place where we're not ready to go, so therefore, I would really like to avoid that. But if that's the if that's if that's the majority of the council that really wants to go that direction and feels it's that pertinent, um, 
I, I would like to say I, I've had the pleasure of voting for only one planning commissioner and that was this year and I went and had lunch with her uh, before I even voted and I, I think that those are really important spots and I was really happy to support her appointment um, and and I absolutely it, it would be difficult but wouldn't have a problem saying hey I don't I think this perspective is probably already shown can you explain to me why this person's bringing something beyond what we already have on the commission and yeah that's difficult but the person would need to know that that's not about the person it's about filling a seat so I hope we all have the confidence to be able to question that and we're in a difficult position but that's why people voted us here is to make some difficult decisions and and to some air some difficult things so as far as the way the the current appointment went I I'm proud of the one that I got to vote for. <laughs> it was a great, uh, Lisa's been fabulous and um, uh, I think she's brought a real, a real great, and as I've heard from the other planning commissioner. So um, again, if you go further, further uh, if we end up passing this, I would like to work with you, but I'd also really make sure that we are very clear in what we mean. We're not just throwing out words like diversity. What do we mean by diversity? And then it should have a component of this communications. I don't know if we're gonna dedicate more funds or how we're gonna go about doing that, who's that person's gonna be doing it, because that communications and recruitment is huge. Who knows about it? Do these communities even have the opportunity? And then beyond that, if you wanna go there and you really want people of a very diverse background, we have to start talking about um, giving some type of compensation, <laughs> because there's a lot, there's a lot of groups, the reason why they don't come forward is they're very overburdened already and we're asking them to come forward and volunteer more. So just understand why I said I think we have a broader discussion here is that if we really want a diverse group, we have to unpack some stuff about how things have currently been set up. So I do support your motion, Michael. Councilman Borneman and then Murphy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Lola Cuesta, right? Yeah, uh, Mayor, I agree with you about not creating specific slots and not calling for that at all. All I'm calling for is not putting a majority of people who, ben who jobs benefit from recommendations that are made to equate a person's profession and the majority in this with race, sexual orientation, and uh, Ethnicity is a really false comparison. That's got nothing to do with it. We're talking about a the poss we're talking about making decisions or possibly making decisions based on uh, you so. and your profession ha getting greater income. This has not not comparable at all to uh, putting. Uh, of race and sexual orientation, those kinds of things. Uh, not comparable at all, and I'm really sorry we went there, because that's, anytime we go there when we're having a discussion on something else, I know it, it muddles everything real quickly, but I think it's a very false comparison and isn't what this is talking about. And so, um, I will support the motion. I look forward to staff bringing back something and us having a fuller discussion on it. Uh, and with diversity, it's diversity of ideas, it's diversity of backgrounds and other things because planning and the decisions made in planning <laughs> is not just about the land use, it's how those decisions impact all the citizens, not just the building industry. It's how it impacts all citizens. And that's why we need a diversity of backgrounds in helping make those decisions and making those recommendations to us. At least that's what I want coming uh, to me. So I'll leave it at that. And okay. Uh, Mayor Kelly and then Councilmember Lillipist. I, I think Terry was trying to give the impression that somehow I'm biased some way and I absolutely am not. But having said that, why... I'm sorry, not why, at all. I will. But, but Terry, why is, why is assuming that someone's occupation means they think or feel a certain way any different from thinking that anything else means they think or feel a separate way? I mean, this is assuming, and I am... 
I am I'm not advocating for any one profession or anything, but it really is a basic tenet for me that that assuming that you can't be a person outside your or that yourself defines your your person. I I don't understand that. I really don't. And I'm and I'm sorry that I even brought it up because obviously I'm in a minority opinion here. But I don't believe in discriminating against people for anything, for anything. Uh, Councilmember Murphy, then Lilliquist. Thank you, please. Just to I missed her. We bring my prior statements a little broader. I just wish the focus was on us. We're the ones that you all elect. We're the final decision maker. And we're the ones that deserve this constant scrutiny and understandable, you know, concerns that everybody has since we make those determinations. The other thing that I worry about is what if we get somebody, I'm just thinking ideally, that was a female and a diverse candidate, but yet we had hit our quota and they were a realtor and we wouldn't get that person. I mean, I, I want all kinds of values to be reflected on the planning commission. And that can mean different professions, that can mean different neighborhoods, that can mean different backgrounds. So I just, again, really worry about when we start limiting those opportunities because I've seen that go sideways in other communities. Councilmember Lilliquist. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. I think no one's talking about filling seats or having a quota. Uh, I think our planning director referred to it as an at-large system, and that's what we're referring to, an at-large system. Um, it's been suggested it's unfair to single out people by how they make their money, but it's an established principle of law that how you make your money matters when you're making decisions. It's sometimes a required basis for recusal if you have direct or, or indirect financial interest. We in this state go beyond just fairness to the perception of fairness. There's a very high standard that applies to the planning commission as well as to us repeatedly in case law after case law after case law that we have to take actions and the planning commissioners have to take actions to avoid even the appearance of unfairness. So it's not unfair to require the appearance of fairness. It's the law to require the appearance of fairness. It's the law to look for direct financial conflicts and to take those into consideration. So I don't think we're inventing a new standard. There's just a very high standard for certain positions, including the planning commission. Councilmember Lilikas, maybe you could restate your motion. The motion was to um, have uh, Councilmember Hamill's uh, language uh, delivered to the staff to uh, include in a draft, uh, maybe in modified form, to bring forward at our next meeting for further discussion of Mr. Borneman's ordinance. Okay, and that dis that discussion will be again committee of the whole. Bring back to big committee of the whole. Okay, all right. So we have a motion in front of us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 7-0. Okay, so we have one set of minutes to approve. This is for uh, committee meeting minutes for November 7th, 2016. Move approval. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ups abstain. Okay. Um, motion carries 6-0 with one, one abstention. Okay. Older new business. Councilmember Hamill, then me, then Borneman. Okay, um, I'm working with a constituent named Jen Mason on um, a proposal for Council Family Day <clears throat> that I'd like to bring forward uh, the, in the first quarter of next year, ideally towards the, the beginning of the year when the meetings aren't too terribly long. And basically the idea is to get families to come out, families with little kids to come out and be a part of, of council, basically. Um, and so I have some details and things like that that I'll forward to you. I just wanted to give you the heads up that that's, that is my intention. Um, I don't know if I need to make a motion to, to do that or um, what I need to do. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move that um, during, the, during the first qu quarter of 2017 that um, this council will host a council family day um, to be organized by myself and Jen Mason. Second. Okay, we have a motion in front of us to, um, as a proposal for a city 
Council Family Day. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Okay. Um, I, does everyone have in front of them the letter for the um, support for the Motka funds? Has everyone had a chance mm -hmm. to take a look at that? Yep. Um, so I, myself, we've also had a staff, Brian Heinrich has reviewed this as well, um, and um, wondering if the council is interested in signing this letter of support um, uh, for the agencies and all the associations that they're writing to to give support to make sure MOTCA funding does uh, go ahead. I, I move that we, that the council support the letter for the 2017 state legislative agenda MOTCA reform funding. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Councilman Bornman. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I guess, a question for the administration because I've had this question raised to me a few times uh, since the uh, recent elections and in the past we had a city policy regarding how we handle uh, uh, people who are picked up that may be uh, might not be citizens might be illegal uh, uh, residents here and that our past policies have been that Basically, not uh, don't ask, don't tell. That we don't turn them over to ICE. We don't, and but I don't know how that is. What we're doing with that in terms of those issues now, and I'm I would like you know I'm, I'm curious if that if if that is still our policy. Of course, it's still our policy. What? But yeah. Well, not, I just want to be sure. I haven't proposed changing any policies, Terry. Right. No, Do you I, want to answer that? Yeah. Yeah, Peter Rafata, legal department. So one of the things on the police uh, department website, you, mm -hmm. you can find a policy on this. It's it's several pages long, I believe, um, and it's uh, something I, that's been in place for some time. But it, it goes through a lot of the, and I think the way you described it pretty much sums it up, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of intricacies to how federal law and, and state law can interact and local officials, but mm -hmm. that policy is, is spelled out on the on the police department okay. website. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I thought that's what it was, but I'm asking just because that's what I've told people, and then I got thinking, I I don't want to you know tell people something I'm not sure of, so I wanted to bring it up to make to make sure that you know. And basically, it was like we're like Seattle. We're not a sanctuary city, but we're not. Uh, uh, we're not turning people over. We're not, yeah, it's a ask, don't tell kind of thing. Yeah. I have uh, two more things, but if there's anyone I else. I just who... have real quick. Okay. Um, I have to leave after the session to uh, my mother over the weekend broke her hip out in Linden. And the only reason I bring this up, other than I have to leave and, and see how she's doing in the hospital, I am absolutely so disappointed in the results so far of EMS. This is something that hit home on Saturday when she fell down. They were there in two or three minutes, the Linden EMTs. And I don't know what it's going to take. We had a unified system. We have a unified people behind it. And I don't want to get in nuts and bolts of the opposition, but I just want to say this. They were dead wrong. You're dead wrong. This is life and death here, folks. And it's just I just hope the numbers come in this afternoon and maybe it'll get over the crossing line, but I don't know where we go from here because this is really big stuff and people who have been demagoguing this ought to be ashamed of themselves and they know who they are. Uh, Councilman Barker. So, uh, and I sent you all an email regarding um, constituents that had approached me in regards to sanctuary city status. I know we have done that in the past, but uh, for different reasons than just uh, undocumented people living here in the city. Uh, I, I have done my best as a council member to attend things, to shop in different places than I normally would, attend different functions than I normally would, so I make sure that I'm not in this echo chamber of parts of Bellingham, which I think is very easy to get into. And in those efforts, um, I found myself on Thursday evening in a, a room of well over 100 families um, trying to get information from an immigration attorney on what the current situation means for them. 
And I think if, if you're especially you know, white, clearly a citizen, a homeowner, uh, I think the, the political climate right now has a lot of people uneasy, but if you could imagine not speaking the language, if you could imagine being isolated in the way that we do with uh, people that are living in poverty in Bellingham, if you can imagine uh, possibly not being documented or having a member that's not being documented or a, a, a neighbor that's not documented, having young children, this, this mm -hmm. climate is, is very unsure. And I think that, I think it's wonderful that we have a policy. I think we need, maybe need to do a little bit of communication with that policy to make sure that it's out there and it's very well understood. But the school department's having to tell parents you're safe to come to school. The school also has a policy on that. But I think we as a city, I would like, I'm gonna make a motion that we um, ask Mark and maybe any other staff member to do a little bit more researching on what that would mean for us to do a sanctuary city, city status on this particular um, issue. And then I'd like to bring that back for discussion on uh, Committee of the Whole. Can that you, was a motion. I'm, I'm sorry. The the content of the of of who would would be affected by this. Who can you just back up a little bit? I apologize. Um, so I, my understanding is uh, is that there are times where if and this is where I would like to work closer with a staff member, especially um, in policy, is as things may change and directions may change in leadership at a federal level. Um, things can trickle down and be a bit different. So if we, if we make a statement as a city, what does that mean? And does that protect anybody in any particular way? Is it a motion of solidarity? What is it? I'd like to understand it better so that I could bring back and have a discussion on what that means and if that's something that this council would consider doing. I'm sorry. To to have a status as a sanctuary city or, yes. to, or to look at the options and so we can have a better understanding? I think fully. I didn't want to bring forward an ordinance until I had the opportunity to work with staff, but I have to ask you all so that I can go and work, use Mark's time to find out what does this mean, what are the repercussions, what are the unintended consequences, what are the good consequences of it. So instead of, I can't just go and use Mark's time. So yes, I would like to bring back I'd like to go and, um, I guess, understand what this is better because it's something very new to me, and then bring back some options to council. So I'm just asking for some staff time to work on that. Councilmember Bornman, Len Lillequist. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons I had brought up the question is this was something that we had brought up a number of years ago, and we put in place certain policies and agreements on handling that. Before we go, you know, down the road of, of, of just saying sanctuary city, mm -hmm. I would suggest looking at those policies to see what's in place now before we look at doing, you know, going another level. Because that's, I know Seattle was doing this, the same, uh, same thing, because they have a, our policies are, model pretty similar at my understanding to that so yeah, I'm aware of the policy I would like to investigate the what mean becoming a sanctuary city in regards to this specific specific topic would mean and I'd like to bring it back to council but I need some help Councilman I will second the motion because I understand that uh, council member uh, Barker wants to learn more about whether and how it's possible for there to be local policies that address what are in effect federal laws and federal policies. I'd like to be mm -hmm. educated on those issues myself. Um, that said, I'm very skeptical and I, I, I don't like wading into those murky waters to butt one democratic authority against another democratic authority. I'm on record saying how much I dislike that idea. Um, but I don't know enough about this uh, issue and I think we have a staff member who can look into some of the legal issues and also look at best examples as uh, our analyst is very good at doing exactly that sort of work. Councilmember Knutson then Mayor Kelly. Terry will remember this. We had a discussion about this one time. I brought it. And <laughs> to be blunt, all hell broke loose. It was a rough night over at the um, courthouse. So I don't want to see that again. I, I would not be in favor of that at all. I, I think 
having what the what our policy is now should be where it is now and I'm just going to be blunt about it I don't want to go down that road at all I'm seeing it all over the country in some of the cities that are having it and uh, I just feel we don't need to do that here in Bellingham we don't need to put our citizens through it um, we have a policy in place now and I would hope we uh, stay with that policy Mayor Kelly and then I know Councilman it's Hall. April has something okay. I, just, I want to I want to be assured my my intent and I, I haven't liked seeing that even at the council level where somebody decides they want something and then it's a battle of the wills I I really want to go and I want to learn a lot more about what are the potential consequences uh, what what things do we already have that maybe we just need to do a better job of communicating are, are they happy I, I want to really have a much better understanding but as I started digging into it I I'm not educated in that way and so it was very difficult so my intention is is certainly not to you know bring certain people to make sure that you can hear them and I know it's already out there it's I've been I've been contacted for it so I'm trying to be very respectful in this and making sure that it's not something that we're just saying we don't want to do because it's difficult but that I can go and and learn a lot more about and then just bring it back to council Councilman yeah, I'll support the motion if, my, is, is, if Mark's got the time to, to be able to, to do it, because I think educating is a good thing. Because, but I was the one that brought that forward uh, in the past, and it was one of the most raucous uh, hearings we have ever had. It was, it brought out some elements that, yeah, and I, and, and so, I, am, I know what Gene's saying because I was at the forefront of that one, and but I'm more than willing to vote for it to have Mark do some research. I, but I think Gene's saying buyer beware on this one because about what you're wading into when if we move. Okay. If you bring it forward. Um, I believe she's just asking for Mark right. to do research and bring the knowledge mm. forward. So we have a motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, wait, wait. Sorry, <laughs> Mayor Kelly. <laughs> I was going to support the motion to, I mean, it's, I don't get to support it. I think it's a good motion to have Mark do the research to help uh, April or any of the other council members understand the background. Um, if it came to the point where you wanted an ordinance written, or you wanted to know about our, what we do now in our city and what our policy is, I'd appreciate it if staff, but I think on the education part, you know, staff doesn't really have time to do that for you, the city staff, but if you have Mark, that would be great. Okay, so a motion in front of us, again, this is for Mark to do the research for us to just look at the topic. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries 6 1. Uh, two more quick items for older new business. Um, just an update for council members on office space. There's been a little bit of a delay. <laughs> I know you're surprised, um, and we're probably not moving into our new space until February, just so you are aware of that. I was right. <laughs> so that's the other thing. And, and on the good side, um, tomorrow I'm leaving for Pittsburgh, and I am representing the city and the utilities for the Bellingham Energy Prize at the National League of Cities Conference doing a city solution summit um, on energy efficiency and things we've done. So uh, great stuff still coming out of this city. Uh, okay, we have one more thing. We have a work session on our biannual budget then we have an executive session executive sessions are closed to the public there's a report out in the regular meeting tonight there are three sessions one is litigation Haskell versus City of Bellingham uh, potential litigation and another potential litigation and I will be adjourning from the mayor's boardroom for for committee meetings today thank you